It's wonderful to be here at OSCON. It's even better to be following someone who already has mentioned science for the morning, so I'm not going to be the first for this year. But we will get into some of the broader issues that I face on a day-to-day -day basis that I hope you'll um, enjoy. Now, as Ed was saying, I'm really passionate about science, but I've more importantly dedicated my career to help make research more efficient. This is the reality that I'd love to get to. It's one of my favorite XKCDs, and being at OSCON, I felt XKCD was almost a mandatory tick on the keynote, um, keynote checklist. But what happens in my day to day is that the key word for this is really try, to try to do science, and we're not moving as efficiently as we possibly could. We live in incredible times. Anyone here that has been paying attention to things in the news has seen not only with the announcement of the Higgs boson, but we can now sequence DNA with devices that can fit into the palm of your hand. Um, that's from Oxford Nanopore. It's a technology that came out this uh, past year that allows you to do protein sensing and advanced discovery in ways that we never even imagined before. There's different uh, age groups that we can now put science in front of. It isn't necessarily locked up in traditional university anymore. We've got movements such as the DIY bio movement and garage biology that are breaking these things apart, making them more accessible to people outside of traditional disciplines, bringing together through things like the iGEM competition at MIT, those from computer science, chemistry, engineering, biological sciences, and getting them to collaborate and share ideas, which is incredibly exciting to someone like me. We also have things like the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which is currently being built in Chile. This is something that's got the largest camera in the world, 3.2 billion pixels for this, that can take in 30 terabytes of data nightly. I mean, that to me is really tremendous. Yet, in my day to day, it's like trying to push a castle and just have a, one little person with their hand up trying to change the practices so that we can really maximize what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, more often, the reality in my world is that we're still dealing with some of the archaic principles carried over even from the 1600s. Uh, if you think back to when scientific publication kicked into high gear in 1665, still some of that practice is emerging in our day-to-day -day ways of approaching research and knowledge sharing, and it needs to change. Also, while I have the castle up here, um, some of the other technologies in the last seven to eight years that I've been, uh, that I've been engaging myself in these discussions, when it comes to people wanting to make science 2.0 or science 3.0, and apologies to Tim in the front row for pointing fun at the Web 2.0 aspect, we're not even, if you want to use that as the way we describe it, even at science 0.5. And it's almost like trying to build this castle on a sandcastle foundation. It's just not going to be scalable, and I'll explain to you why. So when it comes to what our future was supposed to be, you know, this was, where is my, where is my jetpack? My day-to-day -day is, where is my data? when it comes to academic research? Where is my ability to reproduce experiments? Something really fundamental if you're going to build upon discovery and try to find new things out? Where is my incentive to change? Scientists can be really stubborn human beings. And if the incentives aren't there, you're not going to see the behavioral adoption. And I'll go into a little bit more from this. So my story, I'm sure many of you have come across those that have emerged um, into scientific disciplines that didn't necessarily get trained in that, or those that did that will relay stories to you of how when they were a kid, they looked up at the stars, they wondered what else was out there, and they went on to become astronomers or high energy physicists. Or those that you know, were really in, in, uh, in detail looking at the dirt and the, the materials that went on to become engineers. But my story from this, I didn't start off as any of that. I started off as a crime journalist, you know, in, the, in, in Boston. But my story actually comes from the frustration that comes along with watching someone that you love deal with a disease that no one understands, that they don't have therapies for, that's affecting their livelihood, and hitting that frustration and that wall. Now, luckily enough, I was in Boston. I was over at MIT. I had the means of dealing with and engaging with others that were also frustrated by this system. And we set out to try to understand, OK, well, what are the roadblocks? Why is this happening? I can be a really stubborn human being at times. And so setting out and, and trying to deal with this problem, not coming from the research side of things, I said, you know what? 
I'm going to fix you. My friend just laughed at me, as you would. But was in the right place at the right time to start to pour myself into research in this area, right when the science division at Creative Commons was getting off the ground. Now, as part of the, the laundry list of reading that I did when we were trying to actually identify what the problem was, there was everything from looking at some of the mainstream issues and some of the more upstream issues, understanding that it wasn't necessarily patents or papers that were the real problem. People couldn't do their research. But trying to figure out how to disrupt that, we brought back to the innovation theory of Clay Christensen. This is a reference to the innovator's dilemma, the mudslide hypothesis, which he posited in 1997. Clay is a professor over at Harvard Business School. Um, and this is really just a perfect, a perfect way of encapsulating the problem that we're dealing with. And it even applies to the sciences. So for those of you that aren't familiar with what the mudslide hypothesis was, this was looking at how the, those that were, at the time, the technology giants and when it came to manufacturing that were producing 14-inch disks, disk drives for mainstream computers, mainframe computers, got completely taken to the cleaners by those that were putting out 8-inch disks because they totally missed the mark. It wasn't because they weren't technologically capable of developing something that was smaller, that had less memory. They just didn't see it on the horizon. And in the sciences, many of the researchers I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, they, it's not like as if technology has never been introduced to them over the last while. I mean, this is arguably one of the most important enterprises that we've ever come across. It's just that the technology is not mapped to their needs, it doesn't understand their problems, and it's overly clunky and just comes down from above. So I thought that the mudslide hypothesis was a really interesting way of looking at this, that it's not necessarily that we're standing at the end, at the bottom of a mudslide and not being able to keep up. We're asking the wrong questions. I like to think back to this quote about how traditions last not because they're excellent, but because the influential people, whether they're principal investigators, whether they're research funders, whether they're the researchers themselves and the postdocs and the students, because they're averse to change because of the burdens of transitioning to a better state. And most of these burdens aren't necessarily technological problems. They're mostly social. And what comes out of this is wasted money, it is really expensive even to just buy a monoclonal antibody to study Huntington's disease. It can take six months, to tw or six months to 12 months, if you're lucky, to try to get these materials to even start doing your research. It can cost you hundreds to thousands to even more in your research grant funding to get this. And not maintaining this information and these materials in a way that we can maximize what we're going to be doing with them is a tremendous amount of waste. We're also wasting time by just trying to push a little bit harder through a system that's not operating to optimize what we can do. And it's just not efficient. And of course, we're wasting resource. We're wasting people. We're wasting the materials. We're wasting the data. And much of this here, what I really like about the waste bin, is that now, as we're starting to see people start to think about the data that we're collecting as this differently, we're starting to realize that we've tossed away so much of it over the last 100 years that it's almost impossible to go back and try to surface some really interesting new insights, which I think is a tremendous lost opportunity. So now I'm at a company called Digital Science, and we're really trying to disrupt this and create better tools for the research community and a number of different levels and tackle some of these problems because it just needs to change. What we know is research. Many of us came from the research enterprise. Our sister company is one of the top scientific journals, Nature. And we have in-house this expertise and this intrinsic notion of how we can really try to make the world a better place and change these systems once and for all. It's nothing new to probably many of you here in the room that the move to digital has really transformed what we can do. But what I'm going to posit for the rest of this talk and hopefully draw some light on, or it might seem a bit elementary for this audience, but some of the baseline assumptions that have been completely glossed over in the last while that are really going to start having a, a significant impact on how efficiently we can do the research we're doing nowadays, how we can preserve it for generations to come, what our legacy is going to be. I mean, this information, it's, it's really our humanity. This is at the pinnacle of what we do as discovery. So, what I'm going to pause at number one, our, our discovery tools, still suboptimal. 
I know, it sounds a little crazy, but take, for example, if you were going to do some early stage drug discovery and search for this really long, clunky string, which I won't quiz you on afterwards. Um, it's a chemical compound that is, is in the tricyclic antidepressant um, side of things. It's similar to diazepam, if you really want to know. But sifting through information this way, while most researchers have slightly more sophisticated tools that are incredibly costly, this still is your first sanity check for doing work in life sciences specific databases, really no better. This is a recent screenshot from the US PTO website. I mean, it looks like a GeoCities site that I crafted when I was a student. But beyond that, I mean, this doesn't even get into some of the other issues when it comes to patent literature and trying to figure out if you can do science in a more meaningful way, because it, by its very nature, tries to obfuscate it, almost as a scare tactic for researchers and pharma. But we can better streamline search. If you think about putting the tools in front of the researchers, searching by being able to draw a chemical structure, that's just how chemists think. But for some reason, it's taken us until now to start to realize that optimizing the, the way that we approach the problem is probably a better way of going about it. And you can then start to link it to other bits of knowledge that you have, whether it's in the paper, whether it's the data set, all of these things that should seem so basic, but we're still catching up. Our mediums are evolving, but our systems are not designed, or at least not until recently, to even capture some of this information. Most life sciences labs, you're still dealing with paper notebooks. By some laws around the country, you can't go through and delete anything from it, so all of the efforts to digitize these things are lost. But you also need to take into consideration, you know, where is, which freezer is my material in? What plate? This is still managed by poorly annotated Excel spreadsheets and post-it notes in most labs. Some of the most you know, expensive research that's being done is managed by post-it notes and poorly annotated Excel spreadsheets. You know, the ordering and processing information so you know how much of something's left. How to even go about the experiment, the cookbook, you know, the recipe, the protocols for this, and all of the miscellaneous literature, because we're not incentivized to, help, to track it. Even the expiration dates. Biological materials? have expiration dates. Do you know how often and how much money gets wasted because no one paid attention to that jug of milk in the freezer? And this is something that needs to change. We're also facing a massive perception issue. The social issue is something that I've spent the last eight years of my life trying to get around. And these walled gardens and, and silos that many people have talked about, whether it's in pharma, whether it's in academic research, whether it's just our own inherent instincts to protect the knowledge that we have, is really starting to, to bite us. And we're getting a little bit better about it, but it is still not helping. We're locked into old mechanisms. If you think about how science is rewarded, the gold, golden ticket, in this case, is still the scientific paper. Go back to 1665. The notion of writing something down on a piece of paper and transferring knowledge that way, it was never meant as a way of locking up information. Even when citations came about, do you know in the 1950s and the post-war time that it was meant as a way to better manage information? Not to lead to this whole competition and, and means of not being able to validate experiments or capture other information inputs that might reflect scientific contribution, you know, the data, the code, the biological material someone makes available, their collaborations, their imprint on society. But we're still logged in something that is dating back to that side. We need to think, rethink our approach. Not only because I'm frustrated, but because we can do better we can maximize and reuse this information in new and novel ways. We've got the technology there. We just need to get the rest of it out of the way. Design decisions are key. Having spent a significant portion of my career working in the open side of things, I've watched time and time again open systems outpace closed. And there's a place for both of them, I believe. But when it comes to scientific research, much of it is unnecessary. Much of the bar many of the barriers are unnecessary. And really allow for network effects. I mean, this is one of the most important enterprises that we have. And it's time that we redefine performance. Thank you.